بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله العليم الخبير المتقن نظام العالم بلا معين ونصير فسبحان الذي حكمته بالغة وعلمه غزير ونعمه واصلة إلى كل صغير وكبير ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في نقير ولا قتمير ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله الذي هدانا بكتاب منير ودعانا إلى الله بالإنذار والتبشير صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ما دامت الكواكب تسير أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين وعن أبي عبد الله جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري رضي الله تعالى عنهما أن رجلا سأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال أرأيت إذا صليت المكتوبات وصمت رمضان وأحللت الحلال وحرمت الحرام ولم أزد على ذلك شيئا أدخل الجنة قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم رواه مسلم ومعنى حرمت الحرام اجتنبته ومعنى أحللت الحلال فعلته معتقدا حله أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام My respected brothers and elders, mothers and sisters and dear listeners Many a times this insan feels إن شرائع الإسلام قد كثرت علي there were companions who used to come and naturally react to some of the ahkam and rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must have heard and we spoke about the battle of the trenches wherein the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed and instructed a group of sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'in to stand up and go into the group of the disbelievers and find out what are they plotting and what are they planning. And at the same time when the instruction was given, no one stood up. Similarly, there are many ahkam wherein the Prophet sallallahu it's mentioned in the books of ahadith that the companions radiallahu anhum would come and they would try to find out what would be the best practice for them to make amal on and that would be sufficient for them into, to, to enter Jannah. So they would come say, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul a'mal ya habbu ilallah. O Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is the best of the actions? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to one companion, As-salatu ala al-mi'ad. Make sure you perform salah with jama'ah. The other person would come and say, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul amal ya habbu ilallah. Tell me something which is most pleased to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Al-infaqu fi sabilillah. Spend in the path of Allah. The other companion would come and say, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul amal ya habbu ilallah. The Prophet alayhi salam would say, Strive in the path of Allah. So different companions would come on different occasions. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would give instructions and prescriptions accordingly. Now it's the nature of insan that sahaba radiallahu anhum were also human beings like me and you. So many a times there would be some Bedouins or people from the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. They would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very harshly in a very simple way. Not understanding the in-depth of the Masail, not understanding the sensitivity of the gathering. They would just come and ask any questions. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhu would say that many a times we would love to see the Bedouins come. Because we are unable to ask questions many a times because of obviously the awe, the respect, the, 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 how we would revere the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Bedouins would be the best of the people. They would come and ask any questions. So there's a Sahabi, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim first volume. The Sahabi's name is Dimam ibn Tha'laba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He comes... To Masjid al-Nabawi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sees a group of people sitting in Masjid al-Nabawi. So he comes forward and then he says, Ayyukum Muhammad, who is Muhammad amongst you? Subhanallah, the commentators of the hadith, they write that the simplicity in the gathering of the master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'een, was to such an extent that an outsider could not recognize who is the master and who is the follower. This is the amount of simplicity. Then someone pointed out, This companion who is reclining and who is 
who is with the celestial nur and divine uh, nur on his face. So they would point to the Prophet this is the master, this is the, this is the Nabi, this is the Prophet, this is who we follow. And then he came forward, he said, you know, I got some questions to ask. Allahu ba'athaka bil haqq. Are you being honest that Allah sent you with this message? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, Allah sent me this message. The Sahaba were observing, they are all watching. No one stood up and pushed him away and said, how dare you ask these questions to our messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By Allah sent you with a message? He said, qala na. Are you telling us to perform five times salah daily? He said, yes, Allah instructed me that five times salah is compulsory upon every believer. He said, no problem. Have you even instructed us that we need to discharge a specific portion of our wealth, which is known as zakat? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, indeed. Allah has mentioned to me that part of the pillars of Islam is you donate a specific percentage as contribution to keep in mind the poor and needy. He said, no problem. Had Allah also instructed you that we have to do Hajj Baytullah once in our lifetime? He said, yes, indeed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it a pillar of Islam that we need to perform the rituals of Hajj once in our lifetime. When he said that, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded and he replied to his question, he said, okay, let me tell you one thing, yeah? You know these five things or few things you mentioned? I'm not going to do anything more than this. Look at how he's speaking. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu are smiling because it's simplicity. And the Bedouins were very harsh and they were very loud in their, in their approach as well. But keeping in mind, these people were very sincere. They didn't have any ulterior motives. They were not there to prove a point. They were not there to show that I am the person who is known in society. They were very simple. Look, we are people who work. We're in the farm. With, uh, we, we're taking our animals. We, we're taking them. To, we are very simple people. I'm not going to be standing. That's why there's a hadith of Sahih Muslim. Mu'az ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. Mashallah, we sat in Mu'az ibn Jabal. He was sent in an area in a mintaqa of Yemen. May Allah make it easy for the people of Yemen. He was sent as a leader. He was sent as a, as a wakil and a representer on behalf of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Mu'az radiallahu ta'ala initially went to Yemen, Isha Salah. Allahu Akbar. And Isha Salah, not in Ramadan, out of Ramadan. He prolonged the Salah to such an extent that some nations mentioned that he read a very, very lengthy surah. Not like mashallah over here, you read in the Sama on or something, they're going to be too long. He literally read a surah, which, a surah which was very quite lengthy. When Mu'az ibn Jabbar radiallahu ta'ala was still reading and he was going on and he was emotional, few farmers who are working in the fields, they broke the Salah, they started reading in the corner. This is happening in the golden era. They broke the Salah. After Salah, some companions came to him and the, some Muslims came. You, you're causing fitna. Why you left the Jamaat? They said that, you know what? Leave it to myself. Don't engage. Don't respond. Don't reply. These few companions, they came right to Medina Munawwara. And they came and they told the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, we're so sorry. You know, we are farmers. We're working in the fields. It's quite difficult. Our legs, our feet. And it makes it very harsh on, upon, upon us to, to, to read these uh, compulsory prayers. We're not speaking about optional prayers. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called Mu'adh ibn Jamil radiallahu anhu, Afattanun anta ya Mu'az. Afattanun anta ya Mu'az. Afattanun anta ya Mu'az. O Mu'az, you are causing friction between your community. Pray that which is convenient for the community. So at the golden era, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the best of the era, in the best of the zamana, Sahaba radiallahu anhu would find some masail to be because they were very simple people. They were very straightforward people. So this group of, this, this companion, Dhimab ibn Ta'laba, he came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, that's, that's it. I'm not going to do anything more. And there's a very famous hadith as well, which we recited a few, week, a few, few days ago. One companion came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Qulli fil Islami qawlan la as'alu ahadan ghayraka. Tell me something in Islam. I don't need to ask anyone else then. Just tell me something. That's it. Brother, you know what? You carry on. I've been told by the Prophet to do something. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Qul amantu billahi thumma staqim. Recite the kalima. Be steadfast on the kalima. This is sufficient for you. Ulama mentioned this is excluding obviously the compulsory and obligations which are part of the arkan of Islam. So this Sahabi radiallahu anhu when he was told the fundamentals of Islam, when he was told the principles of Islam, he left in front of the companions saying, that's it, don't ever tell me to do anything more. I'm sufficient with this. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Aflaha in sadaqa. I take a qasam in the name of Allah. If this person only holds on to what he mentioned before me, that is sufficient for him to enter into Jannah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood the sensitivity of people. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the same time he would encourage Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een and he would mention some qualities of the companions radiallahu anhum which would motivate them, which would inspire them, which would reignite that, that, that course and that activity which they engaged so that Sahaba radiallahu anhum feel part and, pa part and parcel of the community. So my respect to brothers and elders, when it comes to the Masail of Sharia, it's, it's natural, sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. Sometimes we're going to know more about it. Sometimes you want more evidence about it. That's absolutely fine. And this is part of Islam. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, As-su'alu nisful ilm. Good question. Good question is half of knowledge. Because unnecessary question, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that people of Banu Israel were destroyed because they used to unnecessarily ask questions which has no benefit, which are absolutely irrelevant to their anbiya. But something which is related to your deen, something which has to do with your daily life and your daily routine, you should be asking those masail. Because the famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, طلب, طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم. It doesn't say that seeking knowledge is compulsory upon every believer. Not only those few students who are fulfilling the responsibility of studying Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim at the Darul Ulooms. No. What percentage of students and Muslims are studying in the Darul Uloom compared to the amount of Muslims we have in Leicester? Not even a percent? Maybe two percent? How much? You know better. So that's the responsibility that studying Islamic knowledge, something which is related to myself and yourself, it's compulsory. How many Masai we are unaware of, whether it's, with, whether it's with regards to the business life, whether it's with regards to the college and university life, whether it's with regards to our marital and our domestic life, whether it's with regards to our social life, whether it's with regards to coming to the Masajid and performing Salah. How many Masai are we, are we are even aware of? We feel like, okay, there are few students and few people who have taken the responsibility. No, my respectful brothers and elders. Remember, seeking knowledge is compulsory upon every believer. Not sharing opinions, not fatwa shopping, not knowing which is most lenient to yourself, not knowing that this is something I'm going to use to, to defame someone and criticize someone to prove a point that I know better. Nabi Sallallahu mentions, whoever's man ta'allam al-ilma li bihil ulama, Whoever is studying knowledge so that he can show and debate and make a point in front of the scholars, that is going to deviate him. He will be held accountable for that. So when something which is related to our own specific lives is compulsory, we don't even ask these basic questions, whether it's with regards to salah, whether it's with regards to beginning, like even if it's with regards to tahara, or right up till when a person passes away, it's with regards to death and the burial services. Every single aspect and faculty and department of our life, it's essential we should know the fundamental masail. That's very important. Why do we have these adult classes and adult courses for uh, what you call the elderly people, the young people, the businessmen, people who are working, people who don't have sufficient time to go to Darul Uloom? This is the reason. So that the basic masail, something which is related to you, whether we were speaking about recently about, I think just before Ramadan, we spoke about wasiyat, we spoke about inheritance. Every single person has to die. Every single person will leave this world. Then what's the repercussion and what are we looking for thereafter? What happens when a person passes away? How many of us are know? How, how many of are aware that what's going to happen to the wealth I leave behind? What's going to happen to the finance I leave behind? What's going to happen to the qard and the debt I leave behind? This is all questions. Remember if a person passes away leaving qard on his shoulder and no one takes the responsibility of fulfilling the qards, Allah forgives every sin of a martyr, but he doesn't forgive qards. This is a responsibility. How are, we, how are we calculating and balancing our finance to make sure that whether I am alive or I pass away, people are aware I am transparent, I am an open book. No, everything is hidden. Everything is secret. Mashallah, we're not supposed to expose it. Mashallah, this is how much I earn. No one wants to know that. But at the same time, it's our responsibility. How many people now in this COVID left us like we, we couldn't even think of? Something which is in front of us and it's very transparent and apparent as well. People are passing away, no one's sick and nothing's ill, he just passed away. And then we're like, oh Allah, he's got so many, mashallah, my, my, my own uncle, may Allah elevate his status, passed away before the month of Ramadan. These are examples, Allah blessed him with a lot of wealth, absolutely. People who are from uh, that area in Zambia, they, are, they, they know him very well, mashallah, Mawlana sat over here, he knows him very well. So, so this is the reality. And something we need to take, we need to take into consideration as well, that we are passing away and there are some sort of repercussion and responsibilities which will be directed to us after we leave this world. So Sahaba radiallahu anhu were very simple people. Ya Rasulullah, I'm a farmer. 
I wake up in the morning, I take the, what you call, I go to the farm, I do irrigation, I take my crops, I sell it. I'm a simple person. What is related to myself? Then the Prophet ﷺ would instruct him. Ya Rasulullah, I'm a businessman. I go to Yemen, I go to Sham, I go to Iraq, I go to Baghdad, I go to all these wonderful places, I do trading. What's my masail? Whether it's with regards to traveling, whether it's with regards to dealing, whatever it may be. Ya Rasul, like people used to come in the Sahaba who would be there to seek knowledge, they were masail related to them as well. So all these sort of masail which are related to a particular person's life, it's our responsibility to have the basic knowledge and the fundamental understanding of that. My respected brothers and elders, this hadith and this introduction brings us to the hadith which we recited today. This hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abdullah, uh, Abdullah uh, Abu Abdullah Jabir ibn Abdullah, the famous companion of the Prophet sallallahu His father left such a massive debt. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and his father left a massive amount of debt when he passed away. When the father passed away in a battle, he came to the Prophet sallallahu crying. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I've taken the responsibility of my father's debt. Help me. The Prophet said, Oh Jabir, what do you have? Jabir said, Ya Rasulullah, I have few dates and I'm not that wealthy. I don't have much to offer. I don't know how this is going to be possible. Again, this is part of the miracles of the Prophet. Nabi said to him, Oh Jabir, tell all those people who your father owes that they need to give you some time. And at a specific time, call them all collectively together. I'll make a bargain with them. I'll make a deal with them. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala is crying. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my father passed away. I have, I have siblings, I, I have sisters. I have no fatherly figure. When he got married as well, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jabir, Jabir, Halla bikran tula'ibuha wa tula'ibuk. How about getting married to a virgin so that obviously you could enjoy the best of the moments? You got married to someone who's of a very senior age. He said, Ya Rasulullah, the reason I got married to someone who's of a senior age, I got young sisters. I want someone who should be a wife to me and holding a motherly figure to my sisters. This is the intention of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'in. So Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates this hadith that a man questioned the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, saying, do you see if I pray the prescribed prayers? I'm a very simple prayer. Ya Rasulullah, five times namaz. Ara'ayta idha sallaytul maktubat. O Prophet of Allah, Five times namaz, yeah, I think that's, that's doable and that's, there is no, it's not doable, it's compulsory. So, okay, I pray five times salah and then he mentions wasum to Ramadan, absolutely, fasting during the month of Ramadan. It's compulsory, it's the pillar, it's essential, it's obligatory. And then he mentions wa ahlaltul haram, halal, and at the same time, I treat the lawful as permissible and treat the forbidden as prohibited. Whatever Quran says, whatever Sunnah says, this is halal, I keep it as halal, I make use of it. If something's haram, I absolutely abstain and refrain and don't even go close to it. If this is the only thing which I do, then he says, Subhanallah, وَلَمْ أَزِدْ عَلَىٰ ذَلِكَ الشَّيْئًا And ulama here, they know shay'an is nakira. And nakira gives, gives this, this, this uh, ifada and this benefit of explaining that nothing, I'm not going to do anything extra. I'm not even going to read the extra nafal. I'm not even going to do extra uh, donations and nothing, Ya Rasulullah. I am a very simple person. This is only what I can do. Adkhulul Jannah. Is this going to be possible for me to enter Jannah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Naam, yes indeed. Stick to the faraid if you can't do more. And that is sufficient for you to enter Jannah. My respected brothers and elders, I remember when we were doing our Jalalain and our respected teacher, Mwana Suleiman Chaksisa was speaking about taqwa. And he was explaining the aspects of tasawwuf and how uh, in, in, in tasawwuf there are different darajat and there are different level of, 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 uh, of taqwa and piety. So Allah mentions, in Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. Indeed Allah loves those who have piety and Allah conscious. And then in the Quran there are many many verses which highlight the sifat and characteristics of muttaqeen. The pious and the upright and the righteous people. But then they are level of taqwa. So Ustaz used to mention, Mawana Suleiman, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and reward him. He always used to say something. He said, ke is zamane ke andar, I'll translate it. Is zamane ke andar sabse muttaqi admi wo hai jo apne aapko gunah ho se bacha hai. The most pious person we can say or the highest, a very great level of taqwa in this day and age would be for everyone. Whether he's a pious or he's a senior, he's a nun, every single Muslim in this day and age. The amount of fitna which, does, which is circulating in our societies. The best person who's saved himself from any sort of blemish and any sort of fitna and any sort of sin is that person who abstains from sin. So he mentions that there was one person who was set, a very wise person was sitting one day 
and someone came and said back in those days in the Mughal Empire, and someone came, Mullaji Khariyat se ho. He said, Oh senior person, oh oh a Davish, someone who's dedicated himself to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Are you okay? Are you good? He said, Aap jante ho khariyat kisko kehte? He said, Do you know what does khariyat mean? He said, You're asking, are you good? So he the, the, the question was, Do you know what is to be good? He's like, yeah, bibi bache, khadiyat se, khana pina, dukan, ganda vanda, everything's okay. Like how we say, all your finance, be everything, family, friends, everything's okay. He said, no, 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 no. That's not khadiyat. That's not goodness. Khadiyat to us waqt hai, ke subah se leke sham tak apka pura din guzar jaye. Aur gunah likhne wale farishto ko ye mauka na mile ke aapke namaye aamal mein ek gunah likh sake. Khadiyat and goodness is then, when you spend the entire day from morning till evening, and before you rest and before you retire to bed, you don't give an opportunity, a single opportunity to the angels who are writing on your left shoulder all your sin and all the wrong we do. You don't give them a single opportunity to write anything in the book of, good, uh, in the book of obviously, your deeds with regards to your negative sins or bad deeds you have performed. So the whole day, the whole day you spend it in such a manner and such a way that Allahu Akbar Kabira, only the angels who are on the right shoulder, you give them a chance, you give them this opportunity that they're constantly recording your good deeds. So my respected brothers and elders, in this hadith of today, we study of Imam Nawawi Rahimahullah, which he mentions, it's a very simple thing, that many a times as human beings, we can't perform too many good deeds. MashaAllah, may Allah reward some people, Allah has blessed them the opportunity, they perform Ishraq Salah, they perform uh, Salat al-Duha, which is uh, uh, the Ishraq Salah, and then the Zawal, say pehle, Chashd Salah, I forget the Arab Urdu name, the Chashd Salah, then they perform the Awabin Salah, then they perform the Tahajjud Salah, then they perform the Salat al Tasbih, then they perform Salat al Tawbah, then they perform Salat al Shukr, then they perform Salat al Hajjah. Allah has blessed them with these things. And remember, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to always say, Kana idha hazabahu amrun fazi'a ila salah. The hadith is in Fadal al A'mal as well. Whenever something, whenever fear would come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, any type of fear, the first thing he would resort to is salah. The first thing he would get connected to is salah. Because through salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that we will remove all your difficulties. Any problem you have in your life, read salah. And there's a reason why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that I'm seeing Bilal radiallahu ta'ala before me in Jannah. Because to begin with salah, a person needs to be in the state of purity, in the state of tahara. So my respected brothers and elders, again mentioning this point, Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'in kanu wallahi khayra hadhi al-umma. It's mentioned in the beginning in the khutbah of Hayat al-Sahaba, that they were the best of the people. Aqallaha takallufa. They had no formalities in their life. They were very takallufat naiti. Nowadays, we're living in a society where people will praise you in front of you. MashaAllah, brother, you're so good. MashaAllah, you know, MashaAllah, I love you, brother, for the sake of Allah. They'll praise you. They'll blow your trumpet. Never be deceived. Never be deceived by the praises of makhluk. Never. Never be deceived. Because these same people who are praising you today, whatever, and I'm saying specifically sitting on this place over here, people will come and blow your trumpet, oh, mashallah, mufti sahab, never be deceived. And I'm telling you as well, your praises never triggers my thoughts. Never ever be deceived by the praises of anyone. We're not here for this reason. We're not created for this. We will always be replaced. There will always be people coming and doing the good action. This is Allah's deen. He has taken the response. Many people who's doing the effort of tabligh, never feel yourself that you have superiority and you're doing more work. You don't do anything. We're doing nothing. This is the tawfiq of Allah that Allah has chosen us for this work. It's not our kamal. It's not how good, how good I speak. It's not how good I present myself in front of people. No. There are people who are hidden. Wallahi al-Azim, Allah is keeping this calamity, removing the calamities and catastrophes from our nation and our ummah because of those hidden gems. They are the real and true soldiers of this ummah. No one knows them, but they are crying in the dead of the night. They are contributing and doing donations secretly. That the wrath of Allah, the anger of Allah is distinguished by sadaqah, through the barakah of sadaqah, through the barakah and blessing of sadaqah. How many people they strive and throughout the year we see them, not a single salah they missed in the masjid. How many of them? They walk to the masjid, they drive to the masjid, Salah is very essential and important. MashaAllah, the masjid is packed. May Allah reward you all. May Allah keep us steadfast on salah. One of the, my two points I want to mention as well, before obviously tonight is Laylatul Qadr, tonight is the now, night of power, tonight is the night of decree and faith as well. May Allah grant us Laylatul Qadr and the bar barakah and blessings of Laylatul Qadr as well. But my respected brothers and elders, this is something we've been saying and you must have heard since a small child as well. 
through the month of Ramadan, mashallah, we strive, we perform, we do good deeds, and alhamdulillah, we engage, we congregate. It's a wonderful environment. Whether it's Salatul Tarawi, whether it's fasting, whether it's Salatul Qiyam, the Salatul Tarawi, and after Salatul Qiyam, which we perform in Tahajjud Salah, whether it's the Witr Salah with congregation, whether it's the Fajr Salah, whether it's the Dhahr Salah, whether it's the programs, we should engage in mashallah in the month of Ramadan. It's like the waves of Hidayah which is coming and encapsulating one and all. But my respected brothers and elders, ulama have mentioned, ulama have mentioned, there are two points which I want to mention, we'll conclude with this hadith as well. We say that the month of Ramadan, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa climbed the mimbar and he said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. One of the three was, woe be to that person that the month of Ramadan passes, terminates, ends, and he has not been forgiven by Allah. Nabi sallallahu said, Ameen. Okay. Now what's the sign, what's the sign of a person being forgiven in the month of Ramadan. We don't know. Like we, how, how would we know that we are forgiven? How would we know? We, we're reading namaz, we're reading salatul taraweeh, we're fasting. How would we know? What are the signs we would know that Allah has forgiven our sins? What are the signs? Ulama have mentioned when this hadith comes of uh, may the curse of Allah be and they elaborate and there's a long commentary. One of the points they mentioned, if Allah still gives you the tawfiq, Listen to this. If Allah still gives you the tawfiq and the ability to perform those good deeds after the month of Ramadan, your Ramadan has been accepted. Now let's think. Yawmul Eid, Eid day comes, you'll see Fajr Salah is packed. Salatul salatu Eid, mashallah, we have two, to, planning to have three and some places having four Eid Salah. Absolutely brilliant. Let Fajr alone see Dhuhr Salah, you'll barely see half Safur, half Masjid. Where are the Muslims gone? Where are the Muslims gone? Is Fajr, is, is Dhuhr not important? Is Dhuhr not part of our carnal Islam? Is Dhuhr not compulsory? Is Dhuhr only for the month of Ramadan? Have you only recited the kalima, Oh Allah, I am a Muslim for the month of Ramadan. So if you pass them in the month of Ramadan, then you're good for you. If you don't pass them in the month of Ramadan, you are not performing any deeds, so you should question yourself. We might make as many, as much dua as one, Oh Allah, grant us the death on Yawmul Jumu'ah. Grant us a death on in the month of Ramadan. And subhanAllah, how fortunate are those people who pass away, pass away in the month of Ramadan, in Laylatul Qadr, in Makkah Mukarramah, in front of the Kaaba, in front of the Hajj al-Aswad. Basically, it's a bullseye. They've nailed it. They are the most fortunate people. They are the most meritorious and envious people we see in this world. But my respected brothers and elders, it all builds up. It's not a moment thing that where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gives them this golden opportunity and they pass away and their ruh has been covered. It builds up throughout our life. It's a lifetime commitment we recited the kalima. And observe it yourself. Let's change this norm. Let's change this norm of our society that after month of Ramadan, Muslims themselves, they say, yeah, you know, Ramadan, Ramadan is over. Brother, I didn't see you since the month of Ramadan. Brother, you okay? Yeah, yeah, I saw you last in, in, in what you call, in Salatul Taraweeh. Brother, I've not seen you for so many days. Why is it like this, my respected brother? Is namaz not fard on us? Is this something we have to reiterate? Look at the, the, the people who are 24-7 busy, and they were simple people, and they were simple, simple Bedouin. They also knew, Ya Rasulullah, Ara'ayta ida sallaytul maktubat. We can't compromise with faraid. Ya Rasulullah, after I perform my fard salah, after I perform my fasting, observing the fast of Ramadan, thereafter I can't do anything. Don't do anything besides the five times salah and whatever is compulsory in Islam upon you. Don't do anything extra. And obviously abstain from sins because that's going to keep you, uh, your, uh, your status being elevated. But how many times the month of Ramadan is coming and going? So my respected brothers and elders, ulama have mentioned that the sign that the month of Ramadan has been accepted in your favor is that after the month of Ramadan, Allah is still granting you the opportunity. Allah is granting you the ability to keep on constantly doing the good. Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'een, this, this, this is what comes in hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life throughout the year would be exerting in ibadah. Hatta tawarramat qadamah. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala is reported to have said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform salah, we could see his feet swelling. We could literally see that, Ya Rasulullah, and then she would say, Ya Rasulullah, take it easy. Why, why, why? like, you know, he said, Oh Aisha, afada kunu abdan shakura. Should I not be a very grateful servant to my Allah? He said, Ya, ya Rasulullah, Allah has forgiven all your sins. You don't have to exert. You don't have to go, like, push yourselves to the furthest limit. He said, No Aisha, I need to be, meri sabse zada zimedari hai. I am given the best of the responsibility. I need to be the greatest servant who's being the great, most grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That 
That's the teaching of Prophet ﷺ. So throughout the year, he would push himself to perform lots of ibadah. But in the month of Ramadan, Sahaba radiallahu anhum narrates that Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam would double his worship, and more particularly in the last ten days of Ramadan, washad al mizar. The Prophet sallallahu would fasten his belt as well and his lungi as well, wherein he know he knew now that I'm going to be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa taala. I'll be performing the nocturnal prayers. I'll be engaging in salatul tahajjud. I'll be engaging in qiyamul layl, salatul tarabi. Obviously, however, it was in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is basically the the, the the habit and the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the month of Ramadan. My respected brothers and elders, this is what we need to learn. This hadith teaches us we don't need to do too much to prove ourselves we Muslims. But at the same time, there are some very fundamental things we can't compromise. We are Muslims. My respected, why don't we realize we are Muslims? And I mentioned it the last time as well. Yaqub al-Islam, before he passed away, he told his children, I'm leaving this world. He could have told him that, you know what, make sure that the, you, you sell that property. Make sure that, you know, that deed is done. Make sure that that is... Allah mentions the final words and statements of Yaqub al-Islam. إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي Yaqub al-Islam calls his children and he asks them, who will you worship after me? We need to take account of our own families. Remember, if, 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 if the angel of death comes and takes your soul, you need to think. Sometimes we just need to sit and pause and think, if I have to pass away right now, what's going to happen to my family? Then you think, the wealth I left behind is going to be distributed equally according to the Sharia laws of uh, uh, wills and estate and inheritance. That's going to be distributed. And uh, the, the, the laws of succession and inheritance wills and uh, that's a different wasiyat. But you start thinking that if I pass away today, my wealth is going to be distributed and uh, obviously my wife would be in idda. Thereafter, life is going to be back to normal. How many days, we all know, how many days do they cry? How many days are going to be, we going to be weeping? How many are going to be, going to be crying about oil oh, and remembering the wonderful memories? Life carries on. Life moves on. That's the reality of life. We need to start thinking at the moment. When we leave, at least people remember us. Many a times what happened? Oh Allah, he passed away. He told me that we were just about to, there was a deal in between. Or you know, yesterday he just mentioned, oh, may, I, I make dua, Allah forgives his sins. We say this, rather when a person passes away, we should be saying, subhanallah, one thing I'll never forget, the man had love of Quran. Whenever he sat in the, in the car, he would turn on the Quran. Whenever he went home, he would make sure that he would recite these wadaif and these tasbihat before he went to bed. And remember, my respected brothers and elders, always show the positive side and the pious side to our children, to our family members, especially to your wives. Because when you are not there tomorrow, you need to make sure that you leave those Islamic moments with your life so that she can latch onto that and she can hope, Oh Allah, I know this person. I stayed with him. I was in seclusion with him. I know he's a person of good heart. I know he loves your religion. I know he would wake up sometimes for tahajjud salah and he would say, you know what? Oh Aisha, oh Fatima, oh Zainab, oh Khadija, oh Maryam, whatever the name is. How about reading two rakats? The riwayat of Sunan Abi Dawood, first volume. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is reported to have said, how envious are that couple that if the husband wakes up, he takes water and he sprinkles on the wife's face and she says, we got, and he says, we've got to read salah. And how wonderful it is if the husband is sleeping, the wife wakes up, she sprinkles, don't take a bucket and throw it on the face. Brothers, please don't like, you know, you just go to a, it's freezing cold, you take a jug of water and you throw it on the face and then mashallah, there are definitely, no one will wake up and there'll be some ructions and not only you will wake up, the neighborhood will wake up. So how wonderful, how, what, a, what a wonderful couple is that? If the husband wakes up, he wakes the wife, wife up. If the, if, if the wife is awake, she, she wakes the husband up. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels envy this couple. So I'm mentioning to, the, to you this very specific point before the month of Ramadan terminates and comes to the end. My respected brothers and elders, have some moments with your wife, have some wonderful moments with your children and show them how you have this affection for Islam. Tomorrow when you're going to pass away, tomorrow when you won't be here, they're going to remember when my father was a businessman. People used to salute my father. People used to, you know, praise my father. My father said, leave all this aside. Wallahi al-Azim, nothing will help. If your actions keep you behind, your name and fame and your progeny and your family lineage will never take you forward. But what you should do, have something special. My son, come here. There are four, a few pe poor people. Alhamdulillah, you know. You don't need to let the world know how unfortunate it is. Today we want to show to the world what good actions we're doing. Call that son of yours and say, you know, Alhamdulillah, every month from my account, uh, my wages, I take out a specific portion and I make sure it's going to Sadaqah. 
You know, every month I've taken this responsibility. At least once in a month, I'm going to feed a poor, a poor family a good meal. A meal which, which, which mashallah, I, I feel like, you know, if someone had to give it to me, something special. Oh, my son, alhamdulillah, you see, you show your wife as well. How much concern you have. Speak about Islam. Read. Sometimes, you know, you, you mention incidents to your wife as well. That, you know, uh, when I, whenever I, I, I read about that particular incident when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was migrating, subhanallah, they went through so difficulty. Mention these wonderful occasions with your wife. Tomorrow when you won't be there, she would be praying, but what is she going to be making dua? Oh Allah, I miss my husband. Oh Allah, you've taken him. Oh Allah, he was, oh Allah, he looked after me. He looked after. Allah knows that's his responsibility. That's the husband's responsibility to look after the family, provide for the family. But let the wife remember you with some, oh Allah, I know he would never miss his salatul tahajjud. Oh Allah, I know, Ishraq Salah, Ya Allah, as much as I am aware, he never missed that, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, I know every night before he went to sleep, he would nudge me and he would say, Did you read your dua? Did you read Ayatul Kursi? Did you read your Tasbihat? Ya Allah, he would never miss. Oh Allah, oh Allah, through this one small action and one small deed of his, Ya Allah, forgive his sins. Ya Allah, elevate his status. Ya Allah, grant him the best in the hereafter. Ya Allah, make his abode Jannatul Firdos. My respected brothers and elders, remember, Memories are something people will always remember. There are people who sat over here, maybe their father is not alive, maybe their parents passed away, their grandparents, someone in the family passed away, that's the reality. You have, you have lost someone in your family, whether it's recently or before. All of us, that's the reality. Remember when we start thinking of them, what do we think of them? How do we think of them? How do we think of them? When I think of my grandfather, I think, mashallah, when we were young children, my grandfather, before we went to school back home in South Africa, he would always give us some rands. Five friends, it was a lot back then. Now you can't buy a bottle of Coke. So he always used to give us, now I still remember, I'm like, he was so kind, but, but we don't have that many, many memories with them. As a grandfather, put your children together, share your thoughts. You know, when I was a young boy, mashallah, like you, I remember when I used to go madrasa, I always used to listen to my teacher. I always would make sure, you know, I had some, I had some, I had some practices I used to do. So every time before I left madrasa, I used to make sure I just used to put a little bit of itar and I used to make sure I just used to do anything, any wonderful moments in your life, share it with the young generation. They will remember this and they will make dua for you when you pass away and they will latch onto this and they'll say, oh Allah, leave the money aside, leave the contributions aside, leave how many huffad and ulama you left aside. Oh Allah, as a person, I know him. He was a wonderful, good-hearted person. How, how many of, of, from us can say that our wives would say, my husband never gossiped about anyone. Wallahi, in the house of Allah, as a reality, barely 99% women will be saying, my husband, he knows what's the latest. He's not only speaking about the general public, he's speaking about ulama. He's worried about what's happening in different masajid and who are performing what actions and deeds. That's what's happening with this ummah. Who's worried about the positive things we're happening? That's how we infiltrate negative, and, uh, uh, negative information in our homes as well. That's the reality. No one looks at the good this ummah is performing. Everyone is worried about the negative that's been performed in the ummah. How many of us can say that if I pass away, one of the things my wife will remember with, uh, my, my wife will remember me with is, he never ever made ghibah. Brother, if anyone is like that, please raise your hands up. We want some examples. That's the reality. Because as soon as we start speaking about people, automatically we'll start making ghibah. That's, the, that's our nature. If you can't do good, don't become an obstacle for people who are doing and performing good. If you can't perform any good, don't become a reason of spreading rumors of someone who's performing good. Let that be clear. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kun aliman, aw muta'alliman, aw mustami'an, aw muhibban, wa la takun khamisa. Kun aliman, become a scholar. Aw muta'alliman, if you can't be a scholar, become a seeker of knowledge. Aw muhibban, become someone who looks at people with knowledge and he loves them. Aw mustami'an, only become from those people who are listening to them. Wala takun khamisa. A scholar, a student, someone who's observing, listening, someone who loves them, don't put yourself in the fifth category. How many of us can leave our family members today with saying, my father always used to come, he would say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh loudly. Is this a practice? These are, my father would make sure every day when he's dropping off at school, he would give me a kiss on my forehead and he would say, oh my son, may you have a good day. Whenever I would come back from madrasa, my father would take out time and ask me, what have you studied today at madrasa? My mom, every time she would make food at home, she would teach me and educate me. Oh, my young daughter, oh, my son, whenever we prepare some food for the family, let's say Bismillah. Let's say these are the moments we should leave behind with our families. 
They are the closest to you. Remember the people in the masjid only knows your external because you come and perform salah. Oh, mashallah, that brother was good. But we all know how we react in front of public and how we react at home. Let not the public people in the masjid praise you, but at home people are still hurt. You're not given your sister's share. You didn't give pay off someone who you owed money. Those are the people who will not be remembering you with mercy. They'll be cursing you after you pass away. How about if someone had to say that it's good, he's gone. His presence was more harmful to us than his, than his, than his absence. So my respected brothers and elders, these moments of month of Ramadan, we have created this wonderful environment and we have engaged and we have spiritually uplifted ourselves. We have performed the Salatul Taraweeh. We have, we have, we have, mashallah, been part and parcel of Salatul Qiyam, Salatul Tahajjud. We have taken part in, mashallah, performing all these wonderful tabarru'at and contributions and, and infaq fi sabilillah. And at the same time, mashallah, we came, we broke our fast in the masjid. We performed Salatul Jama'ah in the masjid, Maghrib Salah, Fajr, mashallah, Fajr Salah. Masjid is packed. May Allah reward one and all. I know it's so difficult. This is Qurbani, this is Tadahiyah, this is a sacrifice on your behalf. Early morning you have to wake up and you have to go work. But you know, the month of Ramadan is there. How can I miss Fajr Salah? My respected brothers and elders, Fajr is fard in the month of Ramadan. Fajr is fard out of the month of Ramadan. The only difference is the fard in Ramadan is 70 times better. But remember my respected brothers and elders, out of the month of Ramadan, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever performs the two sunnah of Fajr Salah, khayrul lahu, it's better for him than the whole world and whatever it contains. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the Sahaba, Oh my companion, the Rewaj is Abu Dawood, first volume. If you have to be in the battlefield, it's time for Fajr Salah. You only have sufficient time to perform the Fard Salah and the Sunnah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No, 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 no. Let the horses run over you, but don't miss the two Sunnah of Fajr Salah. This is the importance of Fajr Sunnah, let alone the Fard Salah. My respected brothers and elders, this month of Ramadan should not pass by. And remember, I mentioned a few Jumas ago as well. And because we're coming towards the end, and maybe this is the last Saturday we said, and we're speaking about the month of Ramadan, which is in 2021, 14, 42. If last Ramadan and this Ramadan, there is no change, don't complain if the masjid doors are locked. If the month of Ramadan, which passed by 14, 41 in lockdown, when people were at home, when the masjid and the houses of Allah were locked and closed, and we were protesting and we were starting and screaming and saying, masjid needs to open. Why are they putting the masjid closed? How come infection can take place in the masjid? If we have not spiritually uplifted ourselves, then where are we standing, my respected brothers and elders? The masjid is not only for the month of Ramadan. The masjid is open 24-7 throughout the year. We need to ask these questions and start speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, this month of Ramadan, have I elevated my status? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to be steadfast on his religion. All the wonderful ibadat and forms of worship we've been performing throughout the month of Ramadan. May Allah grant us steadfastness. May Allah ta'ala grant us firmness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability so that we can perform till the final day when we're leaving this world. Wherein the angels come and they say, Ya ayyuhatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyata. Oh soul who is going to be full of satisfaction and contentment, return to your Allah in such a manner, in such a state. You are pleased with Allah and your Allah is pleased with you. Subhanallah, ya bihamdi, subhanakallah, ma bihamdik.